I'm Emily Hawthorne, a Middle East and North Africa analyst at Stratfor, and this podcast is brought to you by Stratfor Worldview, the world's leading geopolitical intelligence platform. Individual, team, and enterprise memberships are available at worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. Churchill created a new organization called Special Operations Executive, SOE, to conduct sabotage, assassinations, and underground activities to harass the Germans while Britain rebuilt its army to continue fighting the war. Welcome to the Stratfor Podcast, focused on geopolitics and world affairs from Stratfor.com. I'm Joshua Cook, sitting in for host Ben Sheen. In this episode of the podcast, Stratfor Chief Security Officer Fred Burton sits down with author, journalist, and Stratfor Worldview contributor Charles Glass to discuss his latest book, They Fought Alone, a glimpse into Great Britain's top secret espionage operations in occupied France during World War II. Hi, I'm Fred Burton here today with my old friend Charlie Glass, who has written a great book called They Fought Alone, the true story of the Star Brothers, British secret agents in Nazi-occupied France. And the book was published on September the 11th by Penguin Press. And for those of you not familiar with Charlie Glass, he was the chief Middle East correspondent for ABC News from 1983 to 1993 and he has covered wars in the Middle East and the Balkans. Charlie, it's great to hear from you again. Thanks very much, Fred. Charlie, tell us a little bit about your story. This is a story that came out of some of my research in uh, the last two books I did in World War II. The first one was about civilians who were all American civilians living in Paris under the German occupation. The second one was about soldiers, the soldiers who deserted from the army. And this one is in a way, a third aspect of the war, which is secret secret operations. In July of 1940, when Britain had withdrawn all of its troops from France, it had no intelligence assets at all on the continent. And Churchill created a new organization called Special Operations Executive, SOE, to conduct sabotage, assassinations, and underground activities to harass the Germans while Britain rebuilt its army to continue fighting the war. And the story is of two young, half American, half British soldiers who were recruited by SOE to be infiltrated into France because they had grown up part of their childhood in France and they spoke French fluently. They were called George and John Starr. Charlie, I'm fascinated by the Starr brothers. They came my way because I was looking into the life of another SOE agent called Tony Brooks. He was the youngest agent infiltrated into France by SOE at the age of 19. And he organized resistance against the Germans in the south of France for three years and had a dazzling career and then went on to work in uh, special intelligence after the war for the British against the against the Russians. But uh, when I was looking into his case, I found out that there was another historian already writing a biography of him, and that historian had all of Brooks's papers and had known Brooks, who had died recently. And so I spoke to this man, and he said, well, I'm doing the book on Tony Brooks, but why don't you look at the Star Brothers? And huh. I, hadn't heard, I hadn't heard of them, so I looked into it, and I found out that, if anything, it was an even better story. Yeah, it sounds like an amazing story. And where were the Star Brothers from in the United States? Well, funnily enough, the the family were original settlers. They came shortly after the Mayflower, and one of their ancestors, Comfort Star, is one of the founders of Harvard University. And they had lived in the country for over 200 years when their grandfather and their father decided to move, move back to England, theoretically for a short time, but uh, for the duration of the run of the Barnum and Bailey Circus. Uh, they were working for the Barnum and Bailey Circus as bookkeepers and accountants, and they came over to England and toured the continent with the circus and then later with Buffalo Bill and his Wild West show, which is part of the reason the boys grew up speaking French in France. That's unbelievable. Uh, what did you learn in the course of putting this book together that, that truly surprised you? 
Well, so, well the biggest surprise to me came towards the end after the liberation when uh, many of the SOE organizers like George Starr and Tony Brooks, who had done fantastic work in delaying the arrival of something called the SS Second Panzer Division from the south of France up to the Normandy beaches, delayed it by 17 days so that they weren't able to push the Allied troops back from the beaches. And uh, I mean, it was a decisive uh, action by the resistance. And these, this was organized entirely by these British agents. And de Gaulle came around France in September after the invasion and kicked them all out of France with no thank you and uh, and called the French resistance people who are working with them mercenaries for working for the British. That that was the big surprise for me. What happened to the brothers later on in life, Charlie, after the war? Well, George Starr uh, was a coal mining engineer. Uh, when, he, when he left school as a teenager, he went to work in the Shropshire coal mines. I mean, working at the coal face underground for years in order to qualify, as, it, as, the, as the requirement was in those days, to be able to go to Imperial College in London and get his degree in mining engineering. And he was a, a, a mining engineer all of his working life. Uh, in fact, he was a mining engineer in Belgium just before the war and was, he was underground as the German army uh, invaded Belgium. But he, he went back to Germany at the end of the war to help reorganize the German coal industry in the German area and the British area of occupation. And then when, when that assignment for the British ended, he went back to being a coal mining engineer traveling around the world, um, selling mining equipment and helping to install it in coal mines. Uh, John Starr was a, an artist, a very um, talented artist, who was a commercial illustrator for a publicity agency in Paris. And he went back to his old job and uh, retired and moved to Switzerland, uh, divorced his wife, unfortunately for him, uh, married a second wife, and, and then died in Switzerland. Did the Starr brothers have kids? Yes, uh, both, both uh, boys had children. Uh, George had to uh, Alfred and Georgina, uh, Alfred, uh, who was named for the grandfather, uh, I've been in touch with for the book, and he's been very helpful in providing letters and photographs of the family. And uh, he, Alfred and Georgina and their mother, Pilar, were just over the border in Spain. Their mother was Spanish, just over the border in Spain, about 200 miles from where their father was operating, but they had no idea that he was in SOE, that he was so close to them because he wasn't allowed to communicate with them and never tried to let them know where he was. And he he wasn't really aware that Pilar herself was working for SOE in Spain, helping some of the um, pilots, Allied pilots who had been shot down by the Germans. Uh, George would send them to the border of Spain and guides would take them across and then she would meet them on the other end and help them to get to Gibraltar. Uh, when you look at uh, a story like this, Charlie, uh, from that time frame, uh, the twists and turns and so forth to me uh, is fascinating. But, you know, in the course of your historical research, uh, which I know is uh, part of the challenge for putting these books together, what was the most difficult thing that uh, you were after that you were able to finally find? Well, with, after the war um – both brothers were put on trial, and I won't um, spoil the reading of the book for people because it is the climax of the book uh, for, for various charges. Uh, I tried, the French tried John Starr, and, and there was a, a trial transcript and the investigation papers that I was desperate to get a hold of, and these were in the French Ministry of Defense. And it took me years uh, of writing, of calling, of sending people over there. And finally, some journalists who had worked in the Ministry of Defense went over and persuaded them to let me have these, these documents, which I needed to understand what happened and, and what the determination was in his case and, the, and the, whether the charges against him stu stuck or not. Uh, they were very, very difficult to get hold of. There is no Freedom of Information Act in France. That's just uh, laser fixation on trying to get to uh, the bottom of the story, and I applaud you for those efforts. I I know how frustrating that can be from just uh, putting my own books together and trying to find things that you know that you need to have. Well, I remember in Americans, when I wrote Americans in Paris about the civilian Americans who stayed on under the German occupation, I wanted to get the FBI file on a man called Charles Bedo, who was an American millionaire who allegedly collaborated with the Germans. And the FBI had taken him back to the States where he died 
uh, in their custody, and I wanted to get that file, and and they they hung on to it for as long as they could, and and there was no excuse. He had died in 1944. All of the agents and sources who were involved were dead, but they still to this day there's some of the some of those pages of that file they won't let go. And you think about that in context. I mean, what could be so uh, still sensitive from that time period that would require that kind of secrecy? It's it's almost uh, shocking to me. Well, when you look at uh, They Fought Alone, Charlie, uh, and you, you're going through your book release and tour now, uh, how does one go about getting a copy of your book, or what's the best way for folks to purchase well, the I, book? Well, I'm, I'm a great believer in bookstores. My, my hope would be that people would go to their local bookstore and ask for a copy if, the, if there isn't one already on the shelf, and if there isn't one on the shelf, to ask them to order it. I mean, I like to keep bookstores open. We... We as readers and writers need them, uh, but failing that, if there isn't a bookstore nearby, uh, there's Amazon, there's Barnes & Noble, there are many online outlets uh, for ordering the book. And you have your own website, correct? I have my own website, and it links to uh, Amazon. And that's www.charlesglass.net. That's correct. Well, it's been great, Charlie, talking to you about your new book, uh, They Fault Alone, uh, the true story of the Star Brothers, British secret agents in Nazi-occupied France, and it was published uh, this month by Penguin Press. Charlie, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. Thanks very much, Fred. It's really good to talk to you. Great to talk to you as well. Thanks again for joining us on the podcast. If you'd like to pick up a copy of Charles Glass's just-released new book, They Fought Alone, The True Story of the Star Brothers, British Secret Agents in Nazi-Occupied France, we'll include a link in the show notes. Or, as Glass suggests, you can stop by your local bookstore. And if you'd like further analytical assessments on World War II and related implications that continue to unfold today, be sure to visit us at Stratford Worldview. We'll include links to some related articles in the show notes. And if you're not already a Worldview member, you can register for free, limited access, or learn more about individual, team, and enterprise subscriptions at worldview.stratfor.com slash subscribe. And for more geopolitical intelligence, analysis, and forecasting that reveal the underlying significance and future implications of emerging world events, follow us on Twitter at Stratfor. <laughs>